How would you describe the social and political climate in Normandy at this uh, particular point in, in time? Well, there were a couple of things he had to do. Uh, one of the things he had to do was make it clear that he was he was really in charge. So he had to basically go around and reduce the nobles to submission uh, one by one. Um, he had to bust members of his own family. So some of his most important enemies were actually collateral branches of the Norman Ducal family. So one of the things that was usually done is that excess members of the family were given important estates or and or important positions in the church, uh, but that did not always conciliate them. So some of his most important enemies in his minority were his own cousins, uncles, etc. cetera. Uh, so uh, he faced a major rebellion uh, from uh, his cousin Guy of Burgundy um, and had to invoke the help of his overlord to defeat him. Uh, but he did that. He did that successfully. Uh, and the fact that he was able to uh, work out an arrangement um, with the King of France that benefited him so uh, materially is a sign of his um, diplomatic skill uh, and of his military skill. The King of France was clearly impressed uh, by this young duke. Uh is it possible that the king might have felt that he owed this to, to William, given the support uh, shown to him by the late Duke, by Robert the, the Magnificent? Certainly, yes. Uh, this is a period when the, the French kings and the Norman dukes uh, actually were getting along. That would not be the case for very much longer. Um, and in a sense, the grant of the Vexen was it was the beginning of a it was the beginning of a disaster a poison chalice it was a poison chalice because i i think the french kings always regretted that and it became a grievance um and it bedeviled that relationship for a century and a half until the final loss of normandy in 1204. Uh, so basically the the french kings I think, well, particularly when with Henry the First, they somewhat created a monster by uh, building up the power of the Duke, uh, because he was able by the end of that relationship to challenge the King of France directly, um, and in fact went from needing the King of France to win a big battle in 1047 to defeating the King in battle in 1054. So in seven years, the relationship morphs completely from one of uh, patronage to one of antipathy. In the context of the, the Battle of Valais d'Une, uh, William instituted the, the truce of God and the peace of God. And usually when I mention these two concepts to people visiting either Caen or Falaise, I see many eyebrows being raised almost instantaneously. Was this move William made in 1047 a sine qua non condition for all his future achievements, his accomplishments? Well, the, the peace and truce of God is a, is a complicated phenomenon that a lot of people don't really um, understand if they're not deeply enmeshed in this period. Uh, it has its roots in southern France in the late 10th century, and it was part of a movement, really an alliance between the church and the leading nobles, the most important nobles of the area, the counts, to crack down on disorder. This is a period when the writ of the French king did not really run in that part of the kingdom at all, and there weren't really many good ways of stopping localized violence. There was a lot of just local brigandage, uh, lawless knights, castellans, people who commanded maybe a castle and were essentially robber barons. Um, and so the official authorities in the church and the county would get together, hold what they call a peace council 
and proclaim certain rules that they wanted everybody to swear to uphold. And then these uh, oaths were taken on sacred relics. Um, and they had to do with a couple of things. One was public order in the sense that uh, you were not supposed to attack people who couldn't defend themselves. So don't attack churches, don't attack peasants, and don't attack unarmed clergy, which should be an interesting thing to think about for a second because it implies there are armed clergy, right? So they're supposed to be able to take care of themselves, right? But unarmed clergy, you need to leave them alone. Um, and also the tie to this were provisions about church reform. So a clerical celibacy, uh, bans on simony, which is the illicit selling of church offices. Uh, so these kinds of things to purify the church um, and society of things that drew us away from God. So uh, illicit violence, money, sex, all of that stuff. Uh, so this movement uh, spread north uh, and was adopted in Normandy uh, as a way of essentially pr proclaiming the official sanction of the church for Duke William's rule. So when he proclaimed the peace and truce of God, uh, he was basically saying, I'm on the side of order and on the side of God, and the church is okay with this, and the church was okay with it. And the idea was that if you were proclaiming the peace, you were you were the source of authority and you had a monopoly on the legitimate use of violence which should ring bells because that's kind of the it's a much later definition of the state um so uh the peace of god also included as a separate provision by this point the truce of god which is uh a ban on all fighting even between people who are otherwise legitimately able to fight um, on certain days and by a certain point, it, it became basically from Wednesday to Monday morning, you couldn't fight. That actually kind of cuts out most of your fighting possibilities. Now, in fact, lots of battles were fought on other days. You know, Norman Conquest, you know, Battle of Hastings is fought on a Saturday. Um, so uh, they didn't know, there were battles fought on Sunday, to be honest. Um, so they didn't always respect that because a lot of times military necessity took over. Um, but when you are making a claim like this, uh, you are stating that you are the guarantor um, of God's peace. So it was a, it was a canny move. It was a power move uh, by William. And it wasn't the first time he'd done it. He'd, he'd done it starting in 1042, I think is the first time uh, that he proclaimed uh, the peace. Uh, but to do it in 1047 in the midst of this rebellion was a reminder that they're the rebels. I'm the Duke. Since the foundation of Normandy in 911, Duke and Church didn't always um, uh, get along well. For example, uh, we were discussing earlier Robert's uh, pilgrimage to Jerusalem, which may have had something to do with the strained relations between him uh, and the men of God in the first phase of his, uh, his rulership. How would you describe uh, William's relation to the, the church if we are to think that uh, our main source of information um, on William is in fact the fruit of the, the work of clergymen? Well, that's very true. Uh, and he got a very good press from the church. Uh, I think he was very successful in his relationships with the church. Uh, he was able to stand for legitimacy and he was a huge supporter of church reform. So this is an age of reform uh, throughout Europe. Uh, this is a period where the church is really trying to clean house and uh, address some of those abuses that the peace of God had been concerned about, clerical celibacy, simony, all those kinds of things. And uh, William was a supporter of this. Now, what he wasn't a supporter of is complete autonomy for the church. He was very interested in having quite a directive role in the church in Normandy. And he didn't really meet too much opposition on this front. Norman clerics were pretty happy to let him take the lead. He presided over synods in the Archdiocese of Rouen, uh, and they were, they were quite thrilled with that. 
He brought in very important reformers from elsewhere. So the most important of his reign is uh, the Italian Lanfranc, uh, who starts out as prior at Lübeck, very, very important monastic foundation, becomes the abbot of Saint-Étienne, uh, and then later, of course, Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, and William's very good reputation as a church reformer is critical later on in bringing the papacy on board for the Norman conquest because he has this track record. Uh, so when he claims that he will reform the church in England, uh, the papacy has something to look at and say, well, yeah, you probably will. Uh, and so uh, his very good and close relations with the church in Normandy actually helped pave the way for the conquest later on. 